Deion Williams. I'm the author of Lord and Legends. And tonight we got a special guest, a good man whose name holds weight throughout the streets of Washington, D.C., as well as the federal system. And uh, me personally, I want to send a, a big shout out and a big welcome home to my man, Anton White. Not to forget my man, Eric Hicks, as well. Welcome home. Appreciate you coming out, man, to man, man uh, the, talk with us and man, share I'm some honored, of your man. views with us, man. You already know how I feel about that. Yeah, I appreciate you for having me here. Man, uh, let's just get straight into it, man. How you feeling, man, and uh, how you been doing since you've been out? I know 30 years in prison is a long time, so we got a lot of stuff to cover. Well, it's like my family say, I'm on a world tour. <laughs> all right, all right. So, but all in all, this, everything still seems surreal. So, uh, let me ask you, for people who don't know, what part of town are you from? You know, where you grow up at? Man, I'm from Northwest, but I claim D.C. as a whole. You spoke about that earlier when we was talking. You mentioned that if a person claimed one, for people who don't know, D.C. is broken down into four quadrants. Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, Southwest. A lot of times when you were speaking, you were saying that, you know, if you represent just where you're from, you know, you're only one-fourth of a whole. Can you break that down for me? Well, D.C. is four quadrants. When you sit up there and claim Northwest or Southeast or Southwest or Northeast, you're only one-fourth of D.C. You can never claim D.C. actually from one quadrant. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's a difference when you sit up there and value D.C. as a whole versus saying you're from Northwest. You're not from D.C. Right. You're a resident like that. All right, so these views right here that you have was one of my questions was basically, you know, what era in time did you grow up, right? So, you know, how did you develop that outlook on unity right there? Well, basically when I got incarcerated into the feds, you know, I never sit up there and went past my neighborhood. So I can never speak on anything else but from First Street. Right. So, when, you, so when you say First Street, you're talking about First Street Northwest, right? Yeah. Okay. So what era in time did you grow up in? You know, some dudes from the mid 80s, 80s, 90s, mid whatever 80s would you say it's your time? In the, in the beginning of the 90s. How was D.C. back in the days when you was growing up? What did you remember about D.C.? Well, more so when I was when I was a youth, I was more so into the Metropolitan Boys Club. Mm -hmm. That's how we used to escape. Since I came home, it's obsolete. Right. Metropolitan Boys Club no more. So when you talk about the Metropolitan Boys Club, you play sports with them? Play sports. What was, uh for people who don't know, when we talking about Metropolitan Boys Club, you know, growing up in D.C., you had a boys club that really represented your side of town or your area. So what boys club did you come up in? Well, more so I played for number two, number, number 12. Two. Where's number, number two and 12? Well, number two is actually off New York Avenue. But I went and migrated from number 13, which was around Lee Joy Park. Mm, okay. So when Legion um, 13 was abolished or was dismantled, they separated to um, the boys' club at number 10 and number 12, which was around Montana Avenue okay. in the Brentwood area. So what sports did you play in the boys' club coming up? Football, basketball, boxing. You just reminded me of something when you mentioned them different uh, boys' clubs. Like, uh, my way, a lot of us play for number six. So, like, I grew up in the Rittenhouse area. But it connected me with guys from the Kennedy Street and Crittenden area. So, when you mentioned Montana, did boys' club kind of, like, uh, connect you to other guys in other neighborhoods that you actually uh, kept friendships with as you grew up? Yeah, most definitely. But number 12, you got actually, that's not my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So, it was short-lived that I played for number 12. Only played for a season. So after that, you know, sports was no good unless you was in school. Yeah, I understand. All right, so uh, what were you into as a youth? What schools did you attend? Were you into sports, which I just asked, or any other things like that? You know, more so, I was into the academics of school. When I went to school, I went to school. What school is that? What school did you well, go I went to? to Gage at the elementary, Shaw mm -hmm. and Dunbar. Okay, uh, I read an article about you some years ago. I actually wrote an article about you some years ago that never really made to publishing and uh when I was reading about your academics, so to speak, and I ain't saying it's the stroke you, but in the Washington Post, they singled out and mentioned that you were good in algebra and another subject, science. science. So uh, at, a, at a young age, you were into these things right here. So how did you excel at these things at the same time while you were, how would I say, it, surviving in uh, Washington, D.C. in the late 80s and early 90s? Well, like I said, when I went to school, I went to school. Right. So it's like, you know, I didn't sit up there and actually frog around actually with my homies from the hood and everything. I went to school. Did you graduate? No, I haven't graduated. Okay, I understand. So uh, just moving a little faster, when would you say you jumped off the porch or you got into the street life? Well, I'm going to say around about 15. Question. At the age of 15, you know, uh, 
when a person get a federal case, such as a RICO, like we discussed, right? How could a person uh, at 15 years old do anything that would add up to something that would turn into a RICO case at a later time? Well, I, that's something that, that the government sit up there and underhandedly play with. Mm. Being 15, you could never really ch be charged actually as, you know, quote unquote, as a kingpin. Mm -hmm. Or you know, a participant. Huh? Or a, I can't say a participant, uh -huh. but you could never been charged as a leader. Okay. You know, because when you sit up there, I wasn't even not 21 years old when I was arrested. Right. You know, even when I was indicted, I still was 20. Okay. So to actually to be charged as for a CCE. You had to at least go back dated five years, and that's until I was 15. All right, so for one second, for a person who don't know what a CCE is, what is a CCE? A continual criminal enterprise. Okay, and you can't be charged with a continual enterprise as a kingpin unless you're what? Was 21 years or old. Right. Really, it was 24, because when you backdrop, you can at least go back till you was 19. Okay. All right, so as we get into some of the things pertaining to law, that'll definitely be uh, one of the things that we can uh, address and we can school some people to that don't know. Because a lot of people sent questions into my Instagram to ask you, and one of those questions were, how were you able to get charged at that type of crime at such a young age? But uh, when did you first come in contact with law enforcement, period? Well, I'm going to say I was arrested a few times as a juvenile. Mm -hmm. And I can't actually give you the, 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 uh, um, the age. But as a juvenile, I was arrested for, you know, distribution of drugs. But you never was committed, never went, never had got a sentence like to go to Oak Hill or no, Cedar on the state? I stayed like six, six, um, 60 days down on Wilson, down Cedar Knoll. All right, for those who don't know, Wilson is a place that's in Cedar Knoll that's no longer open. It's where D.C. juveniles go if they get caught up in a, any type of criminal activity. So uh, another thing I wanted to do is just I jump straight into the federal case because I, I read so many things in your case that probably would help some other people. Like uh, one thing that you always told me is perception is key. So, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, you just get a life sentence. Well, maybe not people that have been through it, but people who looking at it from the outside in. They think you get a life sentence and then, you know, your life is over. That's it for you. You spend the rest of your life in prison. But. These days, a lot of people that went to jail in the 90s, a lot of people that got life sentence in the 90s are coming home. Uh, I got a lot of questions for people saying, you know, how are these dudes coming home? They got life sentences. Some people that are not really uh, pro the people, you know, feel like some people should have stayed in prison. How are guys coming home now that had life sentences? And, you know, how was you able to get out with a life sentence? Well, I'm not going to speak on others, but in my instance, it was all about the drug war D.C., Mm -hmm. You know, where the the drugs was, the ratio was 100 to 1 ratio. But that wasn't the, the instant, that wasn't right there, the end point. The end point of my, my fight was you have a, a, a acquitted and uncharged conduct, which in, in legal terms, they say relevant conduct. So they saying this is what's relevant to your disposition. So by me being charged with murder, although I was never found guilty, I was dispositioned in my sentence as a murderer. So mm -hmm. I was aggregated points. Uh, so for a person to have that disposition and aggregated points and aggregated sentences or times added, you basically are a person that was convicted of a drug offense. And since the drug offense conviction came through, every other thing that they accused you of, they were basically able to punish you for. Is that correct? More so that you're on, you're on the head. But like I theorized, a lot of us actually was not actually um, incarcerated for our crime. It was for our potentials. Mm. So more so, it's like you sitting up there, they looked at you as a drug dealer. They sit up there instantly, assume that you carrying a gun, assume that you participated in murder. So just like I wrote one time in one of my articles um, that was sit up there and actually published worldwide on yourworldnews.org that you know I sit up there and actually um, parallel the fight on the drug wars in D.C. And, um, to the Star Chamber of England, mm -hmm. where they was locking people up and giving, you know, I'm going to just say so people could understand the big wigs or the politicians that was a threat to the king. So this is the thing how they got arrested, like, with crimes that they was never actually perpetuated. And as a kid, by them charging me as a kingpin, you know, I was like, I was like, I was baffled. So uh, I, was, I was 20 years old when I was arrested. All right. So even at 20, at 20 years old, you charged as a kingpin. This is what they accuse you of. And this is the, the, uh, the stage that they set for you. 
Yeah, I hope a lot of people paying attention to that because, I mean, a lot of people think that you got to do things for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and have millions and billions of dollars, you know what I mean? How were they able to, uh, I'm not going to say how were they able to, but I'm going to really say is why were they putting you on the status of a kingpin or whatever well, way you can go into Well, that? I'm going to say they was pandering around the fact that an informer sit up and got killed. Hmm. So when the former got killed, more so I think it was a pressure to actually hope that to pressure me with the murder, the hope that I would return and so quote unquote for the streets a rat or a snitch. Hmm. All right. So uh, I read your case and uh, I've been familiar with your case for probably 30 years myself. I was up to jail when y'all was up to jail and y'all was fighting y'all cases. And I, I read it then and I was reading about y'all in the Washington Post all the way up through y'all appeal and everything that uh, basically got you out of jail. But one thing that was, uh, was a sore spot for me and other people that I was around while I was in prison reading some of the stuff that y'all were litigating in the courts was that you got all this time, you got a life sentence, right? And you just went into the, the violent acts that were never proven, that were really never substantiated, that still affected you, right? But the thing that stood out again is that out of everything that they say you did, they said that you only sold about two ounces of drugs to undercover. So... Not for me, but just for the people. How do you get life for that? And you know, you broke down the kingpin and everything. But if you only committed, according to the case, a crime of selling two ounces or less or more, how is that for for the people who don't understand? Because you know, a lot of people say, "Oh, my nephew got seven, eight years for one ounce. My nephew got five, six years for two ounces." Can you break down how that's different for you with the with the laws that they use to charge you? When they play, you know, it was a simple multiplication. When they set up under the ratio of the drug war of the 90s, 101 ratio meant just that. So you got to look at it as two ounces multiplied by 100. So that's that's the, actually how, as far as the scale of the sentencing guideline, scaled me to a life sentence with an aggregated sentence of murder, guns. So I was aggregated points of obstruction of justice, which I was never charged with. With murder, I was charged, but was hung. Was never found guilty. Never found guilty of a gun. But the aggregated sentence took me beyond the guideline. So when we say aggregated sentence for a person who don't know law, can you explain to me what an well, aggregated sentence is? Well, let's go back to it so they can understand math. Okay. From the 101 ratio, which automatic guaranteed me a life sentence. So if you sit up there and um, multiply two ounces times 100, Mm-hmm. You know, you you had a chart that gave you the scale. Add it to add it to a murder. Mm. Add it to a gun. Add it to an obstruction of justice. Mm. So from that on, you have additional eight more points that took you over the guidelines. So it, by the by the sentence, the guy, the judge had no discretion, mm -hmm. but to sentence you to a life sentence or more. So to fast forward a little bit, I read things pertaining to your appeal and things pertaining to. The First Step Act, right? And uh, when I listened to uh, the case when it went to the appeals court level, I'm not sure what judge said this or that. I'm sure you know. But they were explaining that if you were sentenced in the present for the same crimes, that the statutory uh, limit or the uh, sentencing that you would have got would have been something like 20-something years. Is that correct? Exactly. Can you explain how that would have worked and how that worked with you getting out? Well, in the feds, you have a mandatory sentencing guidelines. So when the Fair Sentencing Act came about, from the 101 ratio was reduced to 18 and 1. So what it also, they had amend that judges should sentence individuals to the statute of their conviction, not under the so-called preponderance of evidence, which was a violation of one fifth amendment. So when you go to one fifth amendment, when you value that, no person should lose a life, liberty, or property without due process that results in a person of guilt of, uh, of a guilty verdict or of an individual admission. No person should have to lose life, liberty, or property without due process that results in a guilty verdict of a jury or of admission. So what you saying that I want to use, I want to use this, uh, this part of the interview to make another point. So with everything that you just said, it's really solidifying the power of the jury as an institution in American justice, right? Exactly. But the jury never heard about your guns, your murders, 
your alleged guns, your alleged murders, or any other violent acts. Well, right? let me correct you there. They had. They did. Yeah, but there was it was never no verdict that constitute me to lose a life, liberty, or property. I was never found guilty. Okay, that was the sec that was going to be my backup. So since you said that, that's what I was going to say. So you said they did hear of it, but they didn't convict you. So they really had no say so, and you getting punished for drugs, violent acts, or murders. Is that okay, safe to say? Again, let me correct you mm -hmm. for drugs. But the amount of 21 kilos, it was never ascribed on my indictment. So the 21 kilos, that take me into ghost drugs. Because 21 kilos were never possessed and 21 kilos was never gathered. So would that fall into the category where people call no, ghost drugs? No, no ascribed on my indictment. Let's break that down for so me. So based upon 21 kilos was never implemented as a charge on my indictment. And the jury never heard it. The jury never heard it. I should never have been constituted for a crime of a sentence that caused me to lose my liberty. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, I needed you to break that down. I mean, as I read that, I saw it, but I said, okay, once we sit down, I want you to break that down for the other people because I truly believe that uh, with uh, the case of you and Eric Hicks, that... Uh, other people can use some of the things that y'all use to fight for liberty. Is that true? Most definitely. But the first thing I'm going to just tell you about that, people need to have an education. Because coming to prison, a lot of us sitting up there is barely have a GED. So actually, we don't even know the, uh, the Bill of Rights, to know our amendments, to know our rights, to sit up there and challenge this. I learned this some years down the line, mm. over a decade. I forfeited 10 years of my life. I actually didn't know that I was really sentenced illegally. <laughs>